Racism is one of the greatest bait and switches you can ever pull. Being a neo-Nazi and being the neo-Nazi that I was, was huge. I had made the step into what every gangster, thug, criminal, wannabe gang member, bully, we all are the same freaking makeup. We're egomaniacs with no self-esteem. I learned that there's this great weapon that has been handed to me and to others, and it's, it's you really have to use it in the right way. I'm a scared little boy in a teenage body who I fear everything. I fear my parents. I fear my step parents. I fear my school. I fear if I was gonna have enough freaking food to eat today. I like when someone feared me. I liked it. My stepfather used to try to beat the Italian out of me. That was his, one of his things he said to me. And he probably once a week, it wasn't an everyday occurrence, but it was probably once a week, a, a good whooping was coming. When I went to school was my time to show my alpha male dominance, you know what I mean, in a way. And I started getting in fights right at school. I was fighting the, the other kids just right in class and, and it was, I would just snap. And I never was like that before. I um, was lost. I was truly lost and I did not feel safe anymore. My cousin, I go up there this summer and he wasn't home when I first got up to the house and I walk into his room and it was like a swastika flag, a Confederate flag all these newspaper articles on his wall about neo-Nazis and picture of Hitler. Don't get it really from him yet, but every night, all these other skinheads used to climb up and they'd all park their cars and they all climb up on these balcony and they'd all had tattoos like with swastikas and shit. And they brought girls and they brought beer and they drove like they're cool to me. Right there, they're just cool. One night, all these skinheads were going to this concert and they were going to bring me. And I'm still a little skater kid, I'm not shaved or anything. And as they're all going to go in to this club, they're gonna go in and beat everybody up. And this big farm boy that I made friends with out of the skin, is probably the biggest boy of all of them, says, I got him. He puts me on his shoulders. And he goes into this dance pit. He's punching this guy in the, in the dance pit and he grabs him and he goes, kick him, Frank, kick him. And I'm on this big dude's shoulders, you know? So I'm trying to kick out him. Uh, as the night went on, we all got kicked out. And that bit, one guy we were trying to kick comes out and he walked the other way and that big farm boy goes, yo, let's go talk to that dude, Frankie. I was like, let's go do it. We chase him down kind of in the parking lot. And he goes, yo, buddy, you got something to say to us? You got something to say to us now? And this dude was like, no, I never had anything to say to you guys. No, I have nothing to say to you guys. I instantly seen it, fear. He feared me and I love that. I'm broken. I'm 14 years old and I like this. We went back to this party and this older skinhead guy asked me to shave my head in the party. This is where you shave your head. So they all sit me in this chair and they bring out a pair of clippers and one guy does my hair, one row. Then the next guy would take the clippers and he'd do one row. Next guy do it. And they kept doing that all night. Like every guy that was there did my hair. I was in. Growing up, I, I, I did have some good men in my life, but they would say things. They used to always say, I went to the store yesterday and Johnny tried to Jew me. When I was a little kid, I never got that joke. And I heard it a lot. When I went to one of my first neo-Nazi meetings, per se, this guy starts talking about the Jews and he starts secretly talking about the Federal Reserve. I don't know what the f you're talking about, you know? But when he started talking about the money, it unlocked what my uncle said, Johnny tried to Jew me. And that's how I started. I was f famous in that movement. It was by mistake. I was getting tattooed one day and, and they, this news or somebody called and said, hey, would you like to come up to New York and be part of a show? We'd like for you to talk about your beliefs and you can defend your beliefs. I was like, hell yeah. I 
I started recruiting these kids out of this high school, and I went and got my own cable access television show. Selling point, easy. It's the same that's used today is the same, the same stuff I used to say back then. And that is, you want to be proud of your heritage, don't you? You want to be proud of your heritage? You know you can't be proud to be white in this country without being considered a racist, right? We're a group that's proud of our heritage, and we're not going to back down from that. I would say, you know, why do they get BET and we don't get white entertainment television? Affirmative action, they steal jobs from white people to give them to black people, uh, you know. And I wasn't born with no silver spoon in my mouth. Why did they, you know, why? Well, how, I was born as, just poor as bad as they were in a really bad neighborhood. Like, why don't I get an extra hand up, you know? And this town of Springfield, Illinois was like, tore up. I mean, like we tore, we went from like four or five skinheads to like 40 in like a couple weeks. We were recruiting out of high school and uh, I became this like little somewhat quasi celebrity. I tell you to come be part of, be proud of your heritage, but when you came to our meetings, we never talked about our heritage. We always talked about, look at what they're doing. So all this is going good for me as a skinhead leader. And there's a guy who kind of came around, I didn't like him. And he shows up on Christmas Eve for a skinhead Christmas party that he thinks he's welcome to. Brought him in the back room and said, yo, I gotta talk to you about something. And he's like, okay. And I brought him back there and I like, at the end of it, I pulled out a shotgun. And I was just, said, you ain't going nowhere. And me and my roommate and another guy violently tortured and beat this man on videotape. From uh, about 10 o'clock at night till probably four in the morning, you know, in the morning time. Just tortured him and beat him. We let him go and he goes and tells the police that we kidnapped him and the police come and arrest me. I can give you a whole big long story, but they arrest me at the next taping of my TV show because I was hiding out. And for the first time ever, I'm charged as an adult. Yeah, 17, but my charges were so violent and hideous, they charged me as an adult. When I got out of prison, like I had some boys that were cool with me, but I was still going to go back. To, I mean, I still was going to stay being who I was. That's what God's purpose was me to start this race war, and that's what I thought about. And in prison, you just I was just playing. I just went to pass time. It's 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 not reality in there. So he hired me on. I worked there and delivered furniture for him and stuff. So. I talked to him on the phone and kind of, you know, told him what we were doing and how we've been talking to you. And he was like, oh, yeah, Frank, he really, like, changed his life, didn't he? <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. That's what I mean. Keith didn't do it. To like, Keith, I swear, like, everyone's like, well, that, he knew. He was, and Keith didn't. Keith just didn't get, he just wanted a good company in the truck. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he wanted a good employee. Good employee. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, they're gigantic. Frank, what's up, man? Good to see you. How's it going? Good, good. Frank came in with the tattoos and the whole bullshit and everything. And I'm looking at him like, oh, what the f***? But okay. But anyway, me and Frankie, there really wasn't a, uh, 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 there was more similarities between us. I mean, we literally grew up three blocks away from each other. You know, my idea was, you know, know thy enemy type of situation, you know, for factual reasons, you know, and, um, you know, so I hired him and, uh, you know, kind of dig into his brain, see what made him tick. Keith, I thought he was going to Jew me in the end. He was not going to give me our f***ing money. And so I remember <laughs> having, waiting for him to, to try and do that. And then when he came up and you gave me extra money that night, you gave me an extra hundred bucks. And I was just like, you son of a, like, I'm waiting. I went to argue with you, I think that was my, and then when you gave me the job, I was like, holy, like, wow. And one day I broke a piece of furniture, which you did not break. I was like, Keith. I'm so sorry. I'm so stupid, dude. I'm so fucking stupid, man. I'm so sorry. You know, and I remember that, and I remember screaming and hollering and having my flip out. Driving through New Jersey, and he starts to fucking unload on me. He's like, I hate when you say you're stupid. Here's where he blew my mind. He goes, Frank, smart people can fake being dumb, but dumb people can't fake being smart. You're just fucking smart, dude. Get over it. 
you were still a pretty insecure person at that time. Sure. Stuff like that happens, and it's, it's, just, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, I just remember, because I had my, my boots on that day with the red laces, which meant I was a The neo-Nazi. red f***ing laces, I remember those. <laughs> and I remember I was trying to hide my boots, and I'm like, I'm gonna hide that I'm a neo-Nazi today. And that was my day I made the decision, like, I'm done. And I never put those boots back on my feet ever again, never. It was one of the things where it's a perfect, uh, I hate the perfect storm analogy, but I mean, I was thinking about changing, there was other things changing, and then, but my last thing to hold on to was this, this hatred of Jews, and then here's this guy who gives me a job that nobody else was giving me a job at the time. Nobody. I kept being wrong. He kept proving me, he kept proving me wrong and not even knowing it. The day that people treated me as a human being, I couldn't fight that. I still tried to still be a neo-Nazi because he was just one Jew. It's just one Jew. The rest of them were all. He wasn't like anything. He was just a good f***ing human being in my life. I was beating my head against the wall at the end to believe it. And every racist, especially in America, we all make exceptions. We've all fall for the bait and switch, but we also all make exceptions. And you, everyone in this listen to this, and you guys included, you all know racist people in your life. And they always say this, yeah, I hate all black people except for John. John's cool. I work with John. John talks just like us. He's a cool guy. I like John. John's a good guy, yeah. So because you know him, you like him. But the other ones that you don't know, oh, jeez, those ones are horrible. And I, got, I just got tired of saying that now. Every human being has a true gift inside them. There's some, don't, some go to the grave and never find it. Some find it. And those are the people you need to capitalize on, how they can help you and you can help them. And it's not for my grandeur. It is uh, truly to help the next human being. It has to be about humanity. It has to be about having, having some humility, true humility. You make sure if kids will look up to you, 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 you sh show them love and show them respect and don't you know, wave them off. You, you, you do like I did with them, so. You have to coach in life, so that's it.